Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming to this Innovation Insights session hosted by Agritech E. I'm Belinda Clark, I run Agritech E, and you can see some of the members of the team here at the front. And we are a network organization. We bring together farmers and growers with technology developers, researchers, those who are innovating in agriculture, and indeed those who enable the innovation in agriculture to make it through onto farm where it does the job it was designed to do. So in this session this afternoon, you're going to be hearing from a selection of our members who are innovation active. You're going to be hopefully inspired in short chunks of four minutes uh, of a series of back-to-back -back talks. High energy, moving on between the talks. We're not going to have questions between the talks, but if at the end you would like to come down and uh, meet the speakers, please do so. We will also uh, be at our stand, uh, which is in the exhibition marquee, the Agritech E stand, and we can do any connections with you with any of the speakers. These are all members of Agritech E, so uh, we're in contact with them a lot. So uh, we will be tweeting, and uh, feel free to use the hashtag, the uh, Twitter handle that you can see uh, on the screen. So we're going for high energy. We're going for four-minute bursts. Uh, so if there's something that you're not perhaps quite so interested in, you only have three, three and a half minutes to wait for something else. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, and I will see you at the end. Sean, the floor is yours. Uh, clock's not going yet. Hello, so I'm Sean Coots. Microphone? Oh, it will be good. Uh, hello, so I'm Sean Coots from the University of Lincoln. I'm a weed scientist there, uh, but actually I spend most of my time to th these days uh, trying to get robots out into fields. And the reason why I do that as a weed scientist is because robotics really allows us, opens us up lots of different ways of controlling weeds, including some of the older ways. Uh, that then become more feasible and work in with modern agriculture better, like inter-row cultivation has quite a high labour component. But if we can automate that, then that becomes, that becomes less of a barrier. Uh, and actually, mostly here, um, what I'm here to talk about, or what I'm going to talk to you about, is uh, a problem I have with robots, which is that my robots are too slow. Uh, so agriculture, we often find ourselves working in really narrow, really narrow time bands, so if we're going to control our weeds, we're racing the weather, our ground conditions might not be great early in the year. Uh, and then if we wait too long, the weeds are going to be advanced too much for us to control, so the robot is not going to be, the weed control is not going to be as effective. Uh, so how do we make them faster? And robots, sort of tra the traditional uh, um, answer from sort of to date has just been build a, fa build a bigger, faster machine. So build a giant sprayer that can just go as fast as possible across the field. Automation really allows us to open up a lot, lots of other options. And we don't actually know which of those options is the best yet because people haven't really tried a lot of them. So it might be that having a bigger, faster, autonomous robot is the best option. Uh, but it might also be that if your robots can be cheap enough, you could have lots of smaller robots. And so you can increase your work rate by just having more, more robots to control it. The other thing we can do is potentially not visit every part of the field. So if we're weeding, um, not every bit of the field is going to have weeds in it. Very typically, you end up with patchy uh, distribution of weeds across the field. And so if we just want the robot to, to, to visit those bits of, bits of the field that have weeds in them, then it will be able to process more fields for the same amount of time. I won't have the time for a minute. Uh, so, but there's lots of unanswered questions about how we do that and, and how we actually get from the point of knowing that's an option for doing it to the actual um, process or the actual uh, realization of it happening. So the first is we need to figure out where in the field the robots are, or where in the field the weeds are. So we can do that from, a, from farmer's knowledge, potentially, or we might be able to do that from drone imagery or aerial imagery. But those are all going to have errors in them. So if we fly a drone over a field and we try and spot, say, black grass from the drone, if we're doing that very early in the season, the black grass plants are going to be very small. Um, if we're doing it early enough that a robot could then go on after them and control the weeds, the weeds are going to be very, very small. So we might, we're going to miss some. We could do it from a previous year's weed map. So we could see where the black grass was in a previous year, remember where that is, and then go back to that next, in, say, the next time uh, wheat comes up, winter wheat comes up in a rotation, which might be t two years away. Uh, but the weed patches may have moved, moved since then as well. So we're not going to know for sure where these weeds are. 
So the robots, so really this is an unanswered question that we're facing and a problem we have at the moment. The robots are going to have to be driving around the field with a sort of first best guess of where we think the weeds are. And then they're going to have to be updating that guess as they go. And the way they explore the field um, and travel around the field to both maximize how many weeds they capture and how quickly they learn about the weed distribution within that field um, is an unsolved problem at the moment and one we're actively working on. And I think I'll leave it there because I've got 20 seconds. <laughs> Great. So I'm Daniel Kindred. I work with ADAS. And I want to talk to you about a new knowledge exchange platform that we're developing, we've created, uh, called FarmPep, at farmpep.net. Okay, so really what we want it to be is an online version of what we're at now, of, of Groundswell. So somewhere where we can, anyone can connect, anyone can have a, any organisation, can have a, have a page, like you would have a stand here, where we really then try and connect across agriculture and try and bring people together. You know, a space where everyone can come and connect and, and share knowledge and tell people about what, you're, what they're doing, find out what other people are doing. Um, just like an agricultural show. I mean, there's already lots of um, communicate, communities and initiatives out there, but we have, we, we, the knowledge landscape in the UK is very, very fragmented. And really, that's what we're looking to solve here, to so bring that connection, to bring these things together, where we have one space where everybody's welcome, everyone can be there. Um, <coughs> So, we, and we're looking to kind of join them up by not by kind of duplicating everything, but by, by creating signposting, by a space where you can kind of come connect back to, 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 what, you already, to what you've already got, what your, your, um, your website, um, you know, everything. Um, and where you can share projects, share initiatives, um, share what you're doing. Well, the bit which is really missing from this, from, from an agriculture perspective, from, from the farmer's perspective, is the synthesis and the summary. So, what we're, what we're looking to do is to join everything together by, by topics. Okay. Every topic, we have a, um, a, a Wikipedia-style summary. That summary is authored by what we're calling stewards, so kind of trusted, independent people who, who, who can write about that, 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 that short summary, a short, short paragraph about any given topic, so whether that could be regen ag or, or, you know, or, or cover cropping or, or whatever. Then, um, that, then recommending um, any content um, around that topic um, on the site, um, other, other related topics to that. Um, but then at the bottom of the page, then th there being any kind of connected content. So anybody, any organisation, any project, any initiative, any report, which is connected to, say, cover crops, will be then connected to the bottom of that page. So that's how we're, we're, we're looking at to, to make it um, work, you know, and be a, a space where anyone can comment, anyone can like, anyone can follow and share um, share what's on there, and challenge what's on there as well. Um, and ask questions, um, you know, uh, and, report, and, and join, you know, forming this by, by groups, and then everyone can join those groups, anyone, you can ask to join those groups, people being, um, uh, yeah, fostering that collaboration. So we've made this work through an Innovate UK project with a wide range of partners, including Agrotech E, the Farming Forum, um, Innovate, uh, Innovative Farmers, DCRI, Map of Ag. Um, we're now continuing with AIC, AIC, and, uh, AICC in the project. We've had steering from AHDB, NFU, DEFRA, SIUC, Centre for um, Effective Innovation in Agriculture. So we're really trying to take a really collaborative, open, community-wide, industry-wide um, approach to it. And for me, the kind of mo motivation is really to provide support for farm-centred research. So I think if we're going to have, we do, lots of us are doing, and lots of, lots of people around here are talking about their experiences on farm, we don't really have anywhere to share that. And if we're going to support far, farmer-led um, innovation, farmer-led research, we need to have a space where people can talk about what they're doing or find out what other people are doing so we don't constantly reinvent wheels or you know, go along in, in ignorance to everybody else. Um, <laughs> So it's early days, we've already got over 400 individuals on the site, 100, organ 100 organisations, over 150 initiatives, um, over 200 topics. So it's there, get involved, help us build the community, develop the knowledge base, and help us make that platform better. So yeah, farmpep.net, and come and speak to me on the ADAS stand or after the show, after, after the talk. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Firstly, first time I've been to Groundswell, and I'm struck by two things. Number one, it's warm. Uh, number two, quality of the conversations that have been going on throughout the, um, throughout the day. 
Um, I've heard some recurring themes. I've heard about challenges that we face, that farmers face. I've heard about potential solutions. Um, but importantly, I've heard one word repeated time and time again, and you said it a moment ago, collaboration, which lead me on to my first question, which is a rhetorical question. You'll be pleased to know, what is AF? So AF is a remarkable group, um, 3,500 members, um, cooperative buying group. Um, we are as vast and varied, as diverse as you could possibly imagine. We cover the length and breadth of the entire country. It doesn't tell you a huge amount, so I've just told you. So what does an average day look like at AF? We have 95 procurement professionals. We handle more than 10,000 emails a day, 1,200 calls a day, and we place more than 1,700 orders a day. Essentially, we source what farmers need to run their businesses. Now, what I'm going to attempt to do in four minutes and may fail is take you through four small insights, four morsels on what the teams are working on at AF. Okay, so here we go. Number one, fuel tech. I'm going to break fuel tech down into three areas, past, present, and future. Past is simple. We used to go and look in the tank. If it was empty, we would order some fuel. Now, it's a little bit more complicated. We have tank scouts that will tell us when our levels are low. We can set trigger points to automatically refill the tanks. And we have live telemetry on the vehicle so we can see where they're going to be on farm. We can see the fuel as it is going into the tank. But what does the future look like? Consistent feedback from our farmer members is that we don't stop working. Okay, we need to respond to that. So we're working on systems that allow members, farmers, to order fuel 24 hours a day, prices tracked against markets, you know, and it will be there when you need it. That's fuel. Moving on. Feed, future. We have seen, we will continue to see livestock production change. Um, changes can be for many reasons. You know, lower milk yields, but higher sustainability. Lower reliance on medication. Um, increased animal welfare. What else are we talking about? We're talking about changes in diets. You know, we can all see the impact of, that soya production has on the planet. Soya intake will reduce. Other things will see change. The population on this planet is growing. We will have to see at some point um, a reduction in the cereals that we feed to our livestock. We will see an increase in the cereals that we ate. That, that has to happen. So these are real problems for the livestock sector, and we're working on you know, exciting solutions to them. An example being feed additives. We feed a feed additive to one of our cows, we lower the methane reduction, reduction the, we lower the methane coming out the other end. Okay, we're looking at sustainable feed solutions. So we're looking at solutions now to problems that already exist and will not disappear unless we find the solution for them. Number three, and this one is a non-rhetorical question, so I'll be intrigued to know if anyone knows the answer. IOT. Does anyone know what IOT stands for? Fantastic, I heard it. So yeah, two people I think have said it. Internet of things. So for the rest of us in the room, what does it mean? Or more importantly, what does it mean? IoT will be everything. Um, I started by saying what an average working day looks like at AF. This time last week was a very far from average day for myself. I spent the day with one of our lovely tech partners, Vodafone, where they took us through IoT. Now I naively went there thinking they were gonna to talk to me about mobile phones and contracts. We didn't talk about phones or contracts. The future is data and data transfer. Now, we already have IoT in ag. We have sensors on our cattle to detect lameness before I can see it and potentially before the farmers can see it. We have sensors in our fields that tell us exactly where we need to irrigate and when we need to irrigate. And this is going to continue. We have lone worker alarms that monitor people working you know, three miles the other side of the farm. An example that um, I was shown when I was at Vodafone was a huge map on a wall of um, Liverpool City Centre covered in coloured dots. All of these dots represented... A, a manhole cover, and these manhole cover conceal power lines. These power lines corrode. When they corrode, they tend to explode. We try and avoid explosions. Um, so the solution is IoT devices fit on each of them. I'm running out of time. IoT is the future. Secondly, tied into that, data. Um, AF are in, a, in an enviable position when it comes to data. We are fed data from our members, whether it be order requirements, livestock data, cropping data, so we absorb this data. But we also absorb data from our suppliers, specifications, uh, market insights, and what have you. We use data, we inform our members. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll bend down a little bit. Um, so I'm Pete Arts. I work for Berenberg, which is a global uh, grass seed company. We have breeding programs in more than 40 species all over the world. Uh, not in Africa, not in Asia, but we're in uh, Europe, we're in uh, Australia, New Zealand, we're in South America, North America. Um, um, normally we, bre or we always breed for yield, for persistency, for disease tolerance, but in the last 10, 20 years, sustainability goals come in. So we have to breed for drought tolerance. We have to uh, breed for uh, carbon sequestration. We have to breed for lower emissions of methane. Um, basically, less, less inputs, okay? So less um, inputs is less water, uh, less uh, diesel for uh, irrigation pumps to run. So how do you do that? Um, 
we have rain out shelters. So you can say, well, I like to select on drought tolerance, but if it starts raining, you're done. So we build these rain out shelters. They're 40 meters long by 10 wide, and we can slide them over um, selection fields. And by that, we can simply choose those plants that have a better drought tolerance than their neighbor or whatever. But we also like to know the genetic background of that drought tolerance. So we do studies on plenty of traits, and then we look at the sequences of DNA and try to find which genes and which specific sequences are responsible for that trait. Um, then uh, less inputs is also fertilizer, nitrogen. Okay, we had a, a talk about nitrogen use efficiency in the, in the Kellogg tent uh, a little while ago. Uh, we can do field trials, and I think actually uh, yield is going up all the time by, uh, by breeding whatever crop you have. So we actually are always selecting for uh, nitrogen use efficiency if you don't increase that nitrogen gift. So, uh, but at the same time, we like to improve that. So um, I don't know if you're very aware of grass uh, varieties, but a uh, perennial ryegrass variety is a population. Every individual grass plant is a genetic, genetically different. Um, because we sequence everything now, we know that a grass variety has more genetic variability than all Holsteins in the world. Okay, so there's a huge genetic variability which we can select for. So we put um, gra individual grass plants on hydroponics, and we can ap uh, apply a very low level of nitrogen. Okay, and by that we can um, select for those plants that perform on a very low nitrogen level. So uh, in the future we can, uh, we can come up with varieties that have much better nitrogen efficiency than we have until now. And we see so much difference that, for example, the worst plant in the best variety is even better than the best plant in the worst variety. So there's a, for a plant breeder, it's a great system to work on. How much time do we have? Oh, one minute. Gee. Uh, <laughs> oh, grass breeding takes 15 to 20 years, so I mean. <laughs> uh, then, um, okay, let's go to uh, the last one, lower emissions. Um, uh, my previous talker uh, talked about uh, uh, methane emission, right? And um, so you can improve or lower the methane emission by improving your uh, forage. Okay, if it's better digestible, uh, there's, uh, the passage in the rumen is quicker and you have less uh, methane emission. So we try to do that by gene editing. So we try to alter the lignin pathway. We don't try it, we do it. And, uh, uh, and by that, you can improve digestibility with 10%. And have a lot, uh, we, have, we are aiming at 30% methane emission by just applying a better forage. And uh, gene editing, and thank God, UK stepped out of the European Union. Uh, we can apply gene editing in the UK pretty soon. So uh, um, there's a lot of stuff to come and uh, genetics are, are great, and uh, we will come up with a lot of new products that will be very exciting. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Karen Fincher. I work for Bear Crop Science in uh, the U.S. Um, we are a large company that has multiple divisions, and the Crop Science Division, our R&D, is focused on seeds and traits. I actually know a lot about the trait side if, if anyone wants to talk to me about it later. Um, and then we have our small molecules, our chemistry division, and we have our biologics division as well. The group that I'm in sits between the research divisions and external uh, researchers such as agritech or universities and facilitates those collaborations to find solutions to uh, the problems that we're trying to solve. Because at Bayer, our mission is health for all and hunger for none. We are really committed to improving sustainable agriculture worldwide and bringing solutions to smallholder farmers. In a lot of instances, frankly, the products we develop and sell are too expensive for the average subsistence farmer to apply in their field. So we do have programs that look at how we can take what we have developed for um, industrial agriculture or, or developed countries and apply them to small, smaller um, undeveloped countries as well. And biologics is a great solution for that problem. Um, as you know, I'm sure there's more diversity in the biologic realm than there is in any other um, clade of the animal kingdom. And we can harness some of that diversity to give us the solutions that we need in agriculture. For instance, improving the soil, 
increasing the nitrogen uptake of plants or other mineralization and uptake into the plants. We're looking for biologic solutions that can deliver that, whether it comes with the seed as a package or is a product that the farmer can then um, apply at planting or during the season. We also have a program for um, disease control. So we have some products, particularly for veg, for the vegetable market that will, um, can be sprayed onto the plants and de deliver disease control during the season. So it's a, it's a non-chemical approach to um, disease control in plants. Uh, we also have a project on citrus greening, um, which I don't think is an issue in the UK, but in the US where we grow oranges, it's a huge problem. That disease is decimating the citrus industry. So we're working to find a solution together with the Citrus Research Defense Fund to find a biologic solution that will solve that disease problem. We recently, I can't see the time, we recently announced for biologics in particular that we're switching to an open innovation model where we are going to partner with other people to do the discovery um, and then Bayer is going to focus on developing and delivering that product to the marketplace. Um, so we, we hope to make a lot of connections, particularly with universities that are doing cutting edge research in biologics, and then be able to bring some new products to the marketplace. All right, I think that's it. Thank you. Hello. Um, so my name is Gemma Taylor, and I work for Crop Health and Protection, or CHAP for short. Uh, we are one of the four UK agri-tech centres, uh, focusing on UK agriculture um, and bringing innovation to that forum. Uh, we were set up in around 2015, 2016, and were funded by Innovate UK. Um, we fulfil a number of functions uh, as part of that, um, but a lot of it is to do with sort of building this innovation. So it's um, building projects and consortiums, winning grant funding, but we also have a range of different facilities across the country which are open access for anyone who wants to come and use them um, as long as they're funded, so commercially or grant funded as well, sort of come to us and build projects and, and use these facilities. Um, they range from glass houses to uh, lab and sequencing um, to imaging uh, to mesocosm. There's a whole range of different things that we can do um, and want to get these things used. Um, the other thing that we do to sort of increase innovation um, in the sector is run what we call the New Innovations Programme. Um, and that's the large majority of what my role is, um, is to sort of make that happen. Um, now, this is a process that we go through um, to generate ideas um, to create solutions to solve a problem. Uh, so we work together to come up with uh, what we think is sort of a big... Uh, problem area or a topic um, in the UK agriculture um, and then we gather experts to be stakeholders with us in this program from across the sector and have that sort of process of what is the problem do we understand it um, and then start the process of well what ideas can we come up with to try and solve um, those problems that we've identified and we go through a process along the uh, treasury's five case model to be able to create a business case so we um, create ideas we test them back with our stakeholders and we take them through an assessment process to say, well, actually, how's it going to work in practice? How do we associate the economics and what are some of the other qualitative be benefits that come with that and what about the risks? Um, and once we go through that process, uh, we end up getting, getting to a point where we can choose which one of those four or five solutions is going to be the best one that we're going to run with. Um, now, about a year ago, um, we did a program exactly that on regenerative agriculture. Um, and that gave us the opportunity to really understand uh, much more what are some of the, the problems, the issues uh, with Regen Ag at the moment, um, and what are the solutions that are going to try and solve some of those problems. Uh, so one of the things that was sort of really identified with that was the whole issue around uh, metrics and data and not being able to measure necessarily the changes um, that come about by using Regen Ag methods. Um, so the solution that we've got from that is something we call the field profiler. 
Um, and if you go to our website, hopefully be able to connect to a video that we've had produced that explains that concept much more. Um, but it's basically this sort of data collection, measurements, metrics, um, but at a field level. So can we understand what's going on in a whole range of different things that's going on in the field when you use regen ag methods? Can we measure the difference between when you start and several years down the line? Um, but because we're doing it at that field level, it gives us an opportunity to start doing all the comparisons um, across different fields, at sort of not just the, the farmer and his fields, but sort of across the UK as well. Now, we're at the stage of that solution where it's something that we've built up and know that it's really good and really exciting and really wanted by the sector, um, but we now need to work really hard to bring in the right partners to be able to help us to run with that, but also to identify some really good funding sources. So if this is something that you think that you guys, whatever business, academia, farmer level that you're interested in, that you're doing, um, are interested in that, uh, please come and have a chat, and we'd love to move this further forward with you, provide more information, um, and see where we can run with it. Excellent timing. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Guinness. I'm Head of Sustainability at Hummingbird Technologies. We are a uh, imagery analytics company based in London. We provide monitoring, reporting and verification, sometimes called MRV, for regenerative agriculture. So our mission is to enable farmers to get paid for regenerative systems, regenerative practices, regenerative outcomes by providing cost-effective and scalable tools to verify the practices that are going on and the outcomes that they're generating. So whether it's um, carbon markets or other kind of ecosystem service markets or supply chain initiatives or indeed you know, agricultural subsidy mechanisms, the systems that enable farmers to get paid for regenerative agriculture need cost-effective and scalable tools to verify what's going on at field level, farm level and at landscape level. So what we do is we take satellite imagery analytics and we use machine learning, computer vision, data science techniques to train models to classify and detect the key practices at field level. So today that includes, these are all geared towards a cropping system today, so field boundary detection and sizing, crop type classification and detection of crop rotations, and then detection classification of cover crops and tillage practices. So by verifying these practices, we can do it historically and in season. We can verify the key management practices that drive carbon outcomes, water outcomes, soil health, etc. So um, how we build these models, um, it's not just a case of taking satellite imagery. We have to go and collect large amounts of ground truth data. So we have hundreds of thousands of data points collected, proprietary, ground, proprietary data set to train models. So in the same way that you could feed... Uh, a million pictures of a cat and a million pictures of a dog into a machine learning process. We do the same thing with things like min-till, no-till, and conventional tillage. So we can train models to accurately classify different management practices and do it in a way that then can be deployed cost-effectively, scalably across, in the long term, we hope, hundreds of millions of acres to enable regenerative agriculture to, be, to become the kind of default default position and the most profitable um, and, and most well remunerated option for farmers around the world. So the way we, you know, we can't do this alone. We don't have our own system to pay farmers. We work with the programs that pay farmers for these outcomes. So that includes carbon credit programs and other kind of ecosystem markets. Um, you know, we, we deliver our products to them um, through kind of API and um, integration so that they can provide these historical and in-season verifications of um, farm practices and outcomes. Um, and then, you know, we today we're working with some of the carbon programs. Some of them are here today. Um, but, you know, in the long run, we want to be able to work with everyone across the supply chain, whether it's agri-food corporates, other ecosystem service markets, or indeed, you know, um, governments or quasi-governmental organizations that need to um, verify uh, verify farm management practices. Um, and then, you know, where we are today, we've got, we've got these, these products where we can um, classify system, um, 
practices and a cropping system. Um, we are you know, a very R&D intensive company and our, our mission in the long run is to be able to not only spin these out across millions of hectares so that we can you know, really have very large scale impact across different cropping systems, but also you know, develop, continuously developing new products. So can we detect things like soil moisture scalably, cost effectively? Um, can we detect grazing systems or grazing practices? Um, can we provide a toolkit which is modular, transparent and dynamic to verify regenerative agriculture in many different contexts, many different geographies, to enable um, mass adoption and, and mass scale uh, positive impact for, um, for, for, for the land and for, and for farmers. Oh, I'll stop there. Um, hello, everybody. Um, just a quick question. How many people in here are farmers? About half, okay. How many of you aren't farmers? If you didn't put your hand up, you don't know who you are. Okay, um, so I'm from uh, Map of Ag. We're a, um, a company that was started a few years ago by a New Zealander called uh, Forbes Elworthy, who had set up a very successful farm investment portfolio business in New Zealand um, and soon realised that uh, he and the management team there and the investors needed uh, good data and analytics and insights about the uh, the businesses that they were investing in and running. And so Map of Ag was spun out of that. And um, we've been working for the last few years on um, our key product, which is uh, called Pure Farming. And really what Pure Farming is, is a data uh, connection platform. Um, so we are doing a lot of the hard work around sourcing data uh, on or about farms that may be coming from uh, a farm management record system. It may be coming from your RPA data. It may be coming from livestock movement services. It may be coming from a weather station on the farm, your irrigation records, and so on and so forth. Um, and that is actually, um, any of you involved in tech will know, is actually quite hard. A lot of the systems are not nice cloud-based, API-based systems that we're all trying to build today. They're legacy systems. So we're doing the hard part of, of bringing that data together uh, and then standardizing it and sorting through it to make it um, useful and usable um, and then serving that up to be used for uh, a number of use cases through what we call the data consumers. And those use cases may be, for instance, uh, carbon footprinting a farm. Um, it may be measuring scope three emissions for a retailer around their farm or suppliers. Um, it may be helping to bring different software solutions together so that they talk to each other, so that as a farmer, when you're inputting data into one system, you haven't got to input it into the other system and another system. And in fact, that in many ways was kind of where we, we started out uh, life in terms of, of, of what we're doing. The key thing about what we've built into uh, the platform um, is the ability for farmers to be able to control who has access to their data. Um, we actually, as a business, were involved in doing some work two or three years ago to look at researching a sort of code of practice for the sharing of farm data. And one of the things that came out of that very, very strongly was that farmers needed to be able to trust how and where their data uh, was going to be used if they were going to let third parties use their data. So we've built into the technology a quite sophisticated um, but farmer usable interface to allow farmers to be able to connect up their data to receive a request from a third party who might want to use their data um, and to be able to connect up the relevant data and to agree to the terms and conditions under which that data will be used. And the data can only be used um, under those terms and conditions. So, so building in that element of trust has been absolutely vital. And the other part of uh, what we sort of have built into the, um, the foundation of what we're doing is that we are 100% respectful that the data that is being used, um, our services, is basically in providing the connection but it's not our data as Map of Ag. It belongs to the farmer, and we're 100% respectful of that. So we charge for the connection, um, but the farmers are the ones who are actually agreeing to allow their data to be connected to these third-party data consumers. So um, we're really excited about the product. We're kind of live now with it, starting to onboard uh, businesses uh, and farmers. Um, we're using it with one or two of the organizations that have been speaking to you uh, today in terms of helping to connect data into the solutions that they want to build because our sort of mantra is powering up innovation through trusted data. And that's really what we're trying to do, make that data available uh, to third-party businesses to power up uh, what they want to do. So if you want to know more, uh, we've got some brochures here. Megan, sitting in the second row there, has got a few brochures. We'll do come and have a chat after this session. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Hannah from Safeag Systems. Safeag Systems is a software-based um, health and safety system to monitor all your safety and compliance records on farm and keep them all in one place. Um, so a bit about the company. We're an Australian company um, founded in South Australia in 2014. Uh, we now operate in the UK, New Zealand, um, the US and Canada. Um, and it actually came out of a, our CEO's family farm, had an incident. Um, they were investigated, they came on farm and were looking for all the records around risk assessments, um, inductions, machinery maintenance um, and training records for the people involved. And they thought they had everything covered in terms of their safety in their file, um, but they found that they couldn't produce all of the records that were actually required. Um, so that's where we've come from um, to now eight, sort of seven, eight years into the development and being global. Um, I'm going to break what the software uh, does down into four areas because it's quite, it's pretty much a one-stop shop for everything, asset management, HR, um, all of your documents for safety. Um, and so if you use a QR code inside a piece of machinery or on a structure, you can tap that, you can log the hours or miles of that piece of equipment, um, you can do a pre-start check on it, um, you can see any safe operating procedure against it or the manual, um, you can log a defect on the machine, um, you can tag it out if it's completely unusable and that needs to be reported, um, that then notifies everyone in the team, and you can also see any risk assessments done on that item as well. Um, the other area is the HR area. So all of your users or anyone on the farm is in the system. Um, you can see their inductions, training, um, licenses, anything that's going to expire um, will all pop up um, across the desktop and the app platform. Um, the other area is audits. So that's our most recent um, sort of module that we've built is a, an audit module to, you can put all of your data in around training or checklist into the system, um, enter your audit date range and pull out all of that information, um, create it as a PDF and attach it to um, a, an email or print it to send to an auditor to just streamline that process. Um, another key feature is the ability to track everyone on farm um, and loan workers they can set an alarm if they're doing something high risk to let everybody know. You know if they're within the mapped boundary of the farm, um, and if they've, if they're not, you know where they last were. So if they, you're expecting them to have returned and they haven't, you know where to go and find them. So I've got a minute. Um, so as well as that, it's built with all of the. So it's built for agriculture. So it's got all of the templates in there already. Um, so the full suite um, in line with the legislation, um, when it comes to it, it covers lots and lots of different commodities being across the, the world, so you probably don't need pineapple harvesting here, um, but it would um, be more sort of commodity appropriate ones. You choose the ones you want, edit them, and then they're ready to go and you can, they can send them out and you've got a track of everyone that's signed off every document. I'll finish there before I start and go over time. So thank you. We're in the exhibition marquee. Um, come and visit. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try and imbue the spirit of my fellow speaker here, Christian, but I fear if I speak that fast with that much energy, as a Lancastrian, you would not understand a word that's going to come out of my mouth. Um, so my name's Luke Ryder, and I'm here representing Satellite Applications Catapult. Uh, this is actually my seventh day in the job, so please just bear with me. Um, and if you're actually thinking, who are Satellite Applications Catapult, then you're not, uh, you're not alone. Uh, so what we are, essentially, so we're a world-leading non-profit technology and innovation company. Uh, one of the reasons why you will not be aware of us in the UK sort of space or the UK sort of marketplace is because a lot of the projects that Catapult has been working on has been working in collaboration in, in Brazil and in Colombia and in Southeast Asia, working on everything from deforestation to governance to food traceability uh, projects out there. 
there, uh, working on all sorts of things from soy to cocoa to coffee, etc. Uh, but I'm here today to talk to you about what we're obviously hoping to do in the UK. And I actually have a sales pitch for everyone here today, but I'm actually not asking for any money. And I'll get on to what that means in a minute. Um, Collaboration is something that's also come up a lot, and it's something that we aim to do at Satellite Application Catapult. We were set up in 2013 by Innovate UK, so essentially we were set up by government, and the idea is that we are aiming to collaborate, and we're, our mission is to innovate for a better world empowered by space technologies. Um, Something that's really important for us at the, at the Catapult is about building trust. It's about building collaboration. It's about building um, uh, groups and, and partnerships of, of stakeholders to, as I said, bring technology actually to the marketplace. Um, historically, we've always sort of faltered and, and fallen down when it actually comes to that end user and the farm gate. And that's something that we're all about. So our raison d'etre then is to support the development of the space sector and all space sector technologies. We sit importantly, and this is where we really like to sit, is between research and academia, and also, as I said, the end user and actually the industry. And we like to see ourselves as a facilitator. And because we can't compete, so we have to be non, not, not for profit, and we, ha we can't compete because Innovate UK essentially would uh, cut our funding, we can actually build those uh, collaborations and we can actually facilitate without actually trading on anyone's toes. Uh, we like to partner with other stakeholders and we like to work on projects across the globe. We like to work with people who have that, essentially, that business idea, but they don't know where to turn. They don't know how to draw down funding. They don't know actually how to build a prototype and they don't actually have the environment to actually be able to test it. Um, there's also, also catapults working in the defence sector. There's also catapults working across health and also across environment uh, and all sorts of various areas. So agriculture is just one area where the catapults uh, work What's quite interesting there is, is we're able to learn and, and take lessons from across those sectors. So a satellite-based technology which has an application in, in defence may well have an application, say, in agriculture. And we can actually sort of take those lessons learned from those projects and actually bring them into the agriculture or the agri-tech space. Um, at uh, Satellite Applications Catapult, we obviously have a huge number of teams. They specialise, obviously, in everything from geospatial intelligence, Earth observation. We've got uh, connectivity teams, which have been working quite closely with, with uh, v 5G. So we have 5G portable units, which obviously enable robotics, uh, IoT, as we were talking about earlier, and obviously autonomous vehicles. Um, we've been doing a lot of work, as I said, in the uh, connected supply chains, so some, a project called Trusted Byte, uh, which is working on sort of products coming into the UK and actually being able to certify and, and verify uh, their provenance uh, from sort of farms abroad uh, as soon as they hit the UK, and that's obviously extremely interest in interest to certain supply chains and retailers in the UK. And that's time, is it? Okay. Thank you very much for listening. No, it's okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sam Watson-Jones, co-founder of Small Robot Company. Belinda was actually the, the first person who said yes to Small Robot Company uh, nearly, nearly five years ago now, Belinda, um, to uh, the first person who said yes to a, to a speaking gig for us. So always been, uh, and proud to be members, members still. Uh, and actually four years ago, we came to Groundswell and we bought what was basically a little remote control car that wasn't really doing anything particularly useful, but was a, uh, a proof of concept. So it's really exciting to be here today, four years later, um, announcing the launch of a, of a new phase of our, of our commercial service. Um, and we've been supported by farmers um, from, the, from the start. So what Small Robot Company is all about is per-plant farming. So this is the ability to gather data right at the individual plant level and get an understanding of every single plant in the field. So we've been going into fields of wheat and literally counting the 23 million wheat plants that there are in that field. And then the second part of per plant intelligence is the ability to return to that previously identified point. So we can say, right, I want to go to wheat plant number 18,603,204 and return to that point and either gather more data or take an action, which is the second part, which is per plant action. Uh, and so that's when you're going to be able to, to, to use robots or other machines to be able to say, I'm going to do something to this plant, but I'm going to leave this plant alone, or I'm going to do something different to, 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 to that plant. 
And so I'll explain how we're, how we're commercializing that um, shortly. But we, we think focusing on the outcomes for, for farmers is really important. But I think there are also outcomes in other parts of the industry as well. So, for example, people running trial plots. Um, it's the ability to understand every single plant in the field. And then how that translates to, to, to farming is, firstly, better decision making. I'm a fourth generation farmer. Decision making moved on a little bit in those four generations, but not enough. Um, it's still largely gut instinct and experience. Should be better, should be, should be data driven. More accurate action is the second important income uh, input. Uh, and the, 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 third is, um, the third is increased profitability for the farmer. These technologies can't simply be about transferring cash from one solution to another has to be about increased profitability. And then the fourth is about better outcomes for the environment. And we think that per plant farming can potentially deliver on, on all of those. We're excited about the first, uh, the first commercial services that we're, that we're deploying. Because sooner than you think, every decision is going to be supported by artificial intelligence. And sooner than you think, it's going to feel very strange to, uh, to apply a blanket application of anything across a farm. So we've done a really interesting trial with Tuckwells um, down in Suffolk. We went out into their field. We scanned every single weed in the field. We scanned the whole field. We counted individually 1,700 wheat plants. Um, and then we converted that into a shape file. And the sprayer, their individual nozzle control sprayer, went through and applied the herbicide. But of course, this was in the spring. Rather than applying 100% herbicide, over the field, actually applied 3% herbicide in the field. So they saved 97% of their herbicide. But we think that the same approach by using very, very high resolution imagery and then instructing machines to take more accurate action will translate not only from herbicides, but also into fungicides, also into pests, also into nutrition maps. And this is the start, we think, of uh, a transformative approach to farming, and we call it the fourth agricultural revolution, and per-plant farming is going to play a really key role in that. We've got a demonstration starting at 5 o'clock, just down at the end there, um, just past the Tuckwell stand, where we're going to show our Tom scanning robot and the sprayer integration. So thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's David Newton. I'm the product manager for TMAC Agro UK. So, came here to Groundswell last year for the first time ever, and I was challenged on several occasions, what's a fertilizer company doing at Groundswell? So, TMAC Agro UK, uh, part of the TMAC Agro uh, Group Berulier, French-owned uh, worldwide group, we specialize in technological inputs with three main goals. And the three main goals are to optimize soil, plant, and animal health. Um, we're a tech company um, that produce inputs that protect the soil health, that improve soil health, um, and from that, we can improve animal health, we can improve plant health. So we're an inputs company that wants you to use less inputs. The theory being, if you optimize efficiency, you can reduce your inputs. So using the time available, and I think I've got plenty of time, um, I'm going to give you an example. We just launched a new fertilizer called Fertios 4. Fertios 4 is a phosphate fertilizer. It's based around a soft rock phosphate with added technology. And what do I mean by technology? We use natural technologies to enhance the actions of fertilizers and enhance the health of the soils. So there's four different technologies wrapped up in Fertios 4. Technology number one stimulates, increases bacterial populations in the soils. So looking at increasing mineralization of organic matter, looking at releasing more organic nitrogen, organic phosphate into the system um, that you're utilizing. Technology number two um, is an ammonium capture uh, technology. So what that does is it soaks up the ammonium, prevents it from being converted into nitrate, releases it more slowly back to the plant at a level that the plant can utilize. Technology number four controls the population of nitrifying bacteria in the soil and denitrifying bacteria in the soil. So what this does is it reduces, again, that nitrifying activity. It reduces losses. So you're reducing volatilization, reducing ammonia emissions, you're reducing nitrate losses, you're reducing greenhouse gases, you're reducing um, nitrate emissions. Technology number four within this uh, product stimulates the production of root nodules in legumes. 
So we've seen a 40% increase in root nodules. We've seen a 70% increase in the bacteria populating those root nodules in order to gain more nitrogen from natural sources. So all of this is wrapped up in a granule that will go through an ordinary fertilizer spreader and spread to 36 meters. So, oh yeah, and there's 17% phosphate and there's calcium in it and trace elements in it as well from a marine source. Um, we work on a sustainability program. Um, this product is fully soil association and organic certified. So we work on a, pro on a, a premise that we're looking to in, you know, encourage the soil health, encourage through the use of natural technologies, through seaweed extracts, through humates, and through other um, added technologies, refined technologies, um, to increase plant health, increase soil health, and increase the efficiency for fertilizer applications. That's about it. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you to all our speakers. What a, a whistle-stop tour across a kind of innovation ecosystem. And I don't know if any of you were in Henry Dimbleby's uh, talk this afternoon. And Henry sort of shared some reflections of the white paper uh, that landed uh, last week in response to his food plan. And Henry was very, uh, I think, more positive about the environmental uh, potential from the white paper than he was the health. But he was talking about technology as an enabler. And I think what we've heard this afternoon has really shown that a lot, there's a lot of technology around that really is, speaks very closely and is very well aligned to the kind of agenda that everyone is discussing here at, at this conference. Now, uh, if you want to follow up with any of the speakers, they will be here. Uh, so please come down to the front and introduce yourself and have a chat. There are, floating around, there are some leaflets which give you a very short summary and the contact details of all the speakers. If you don't have one, please uh, let either myself or my colleague Becky or my other colleague Ali uh, in the sound desk know, and we will send it to you, so we'll give you a summary. So please don't walk away thinking, I wish I'd been able to talk to that person. We'll make sure you're connected with them. Uh, again, another way, if you've missed anything, Becky has been tweeting like a woman possessed. So if you look at the Agritech E Twitter feed, there will be, again, a tweet of all of the speakers that you've heard so you can get a summary of, of what's going on. And I'd like to invite you to come to the Agritech E stand, which is in the exhibition marquee. We are a membership organization. There's probably not very many people that we can't find some value to deliver through membership, whether it's uh, for farmers, for tech developers, business support, uh, investors, researchers. So do come and have a chat with uh, the team down at the exhibition marquee. And again, if there's anyone you'd like to follow up with that you haven't heard about, or indeed if there's anything else you'd like to explore in the innovation space, we're usually only one or two phone calls away from someone who can help if we can't. So I think without further ado, I would ask the cabin crew to put the doors to manual and uh, ask uh, to disembark. Come down and meet the speakers, and thank you very much for your attention. It must be nearly time for a beer. Thank you very much.